Let's talk about neuroscience. Something in the last 30 years has significantly developed concerning how do we explain our human experiences and how the brain works in them, especially. What neuroscience can do by hooking up electrodes to the skull and scientifically probing and scanning brain activity while people are experiencing shifts in consciousness, experiencing bright, blinding white light color, is to register different brain states. In the Synoptic Gospels, when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain, how was he described? His clothing became blinding white light, shining white light, brilliant white color. All these instances in such cases throughout the Bible of intense white light indicates to the biblical characters and authors God's holy presence. That is their theological interpretation. In fact, in the ancient tradition of Israel, and indeed throughout almost every religious tradition we have encountered, blinding white light is associated with the holy, with the gods, and the realm of the gods. So, Almost every religious tradition on earth associates the experience of blinding white light with being in the presence of God or the gods. This is a theological interpretation. And that's what you get in the Bible, which is not a scientific book or library. But what about neuroscience? How does neuroscience interpret the experience of blinding white light? Well, It is to see the individual as definitely experiencing trance. And that can be determined through the brain tracings. The research has been worked out by Andrew Newberg of the University of Pennsylvania, together with his late research partner, Eugene de Aquili. They wired up Carmelite nuns while they prayed and while they were meditating. The research has expanded to include representatives from other faith traditions and religions as well. These brain states are pan-human experiences. As we will see later, Paul's alternate state of consciousness experience was as real as Moses's. And alternate states of consciousness experiences are from one side of the Bible, one of the creation stories in Genesis, all the way to the book of Revelation. To better grasp all of this and how it relates to biblical dreams, we should ask, how did ancient folks think about dreams? Plato, the philosopher, was skeptical about the divine nature of dreams. He notes that all women especially, and sick folk everywhere, and those who have been in peril or distress, as well as those who have had a slice of good fortune, are wont to build shrines or found temples on the basis of dreams. Rather disparaging, no? Aristotle denied that God communicated to anyone in dreams, because... Ordinary people dream. And why would God want to speak to ordinary people? Says Aristotle, It is absurd to hold that it is God who sends such dreams, and yet that he sends them not to the best and wisest, but to any chance persons. You see, Plato and Aristotle were elites. You have to ask yourself, how much of a percentage of the ancient Mediterranean world were elites? Then you have to ask, is the opinion on dreams of Plato and Aristotle, does that, is that a fair sampling of how most people in the ancient Mediterranean world, the world of the Bible, the world of the Gospels, the world of Jesus, is that how they thought? Is that how they perceived? Is that how they communicated the relevance of dreams and dreaming? Classic scholars remind us that in Hellenistic times, there was no single authoritative theory about dreams. Aristotle, Plato, even the well-known Artemidorus had little influence over the vast majority of people. It was the Homeric writings that remained the classic sources on dreams and their interpretation. Indeed, for Hellenic culture, Homer comes pretty close to being sacred scripture. In contrast, the Israelite sage Jesus ben Sira encourages paying attention to visions, especially sent by the Most High. Yet this opinion is very much the exception because in general, ben Sira says that only the senseless and fools take dreams seriously. He further believes that divination, omens, and dreams are, what our translation reads incorrectly, unreal. What you already expect the mind depicts. And we have to correct that translation. Literally in Greek, the word translated unreal means idle, foolish, meaningless. The word unreal is inappropriate translation because it contradicts not only Mediterranean cultural consensus reality, 
but also the insights of psychological anthropology. Clearly, back in Genesis, Joseph and his family did not consider dreams unreal, nor even idle, foolish, or meaningless. On this point, Sirach probably is reflecting a segment of Hellenistic consensus reality of his time and place, rather than the vast majority of Israelites and Mediterraneans. In his famous book on dreams, Oniocritica, Artemidorus was interested in dreams as a key to the forthcoming. He considered them to be primarily predictive forecasts of the forthcoming. In contrast, our modern post-Freudian world, post-Jungian world, views dreams as keys to the unconscious, mirrors of the self. Artemidorus distinguished three kinds of dreams, all dealing with external matters of fact. First is the symbolic dream, which is full of metaphors that need to be interpreted. Consider the Pharaoh's chief butler and chief baker, who were in prison with Joseph in Genesis chapter 40. They each had symbolic dreams. The butler dreamed of a vine with three branches whose grapes he squeezed into the Pharaoh's cup for him to drink. Joseph said that after three days, the Pharaoh would restore the butler to grace. The baker dreamed he had three cake baskets on his head. The uppermost had baked foods for the Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it. Joseph interpreted it to mean that after three days, the Pharaoh would hang the butler and birds would eat his flesh. A second kind of dream is the vision, which pre-enacts a forthcoming event. Peter's dream in Acts chapter 10 verses 9 through 16 is called Horama, the vision, in which he saw a great sheet filled with all kinds of animals and was commanded to kill and eat to assuage his hunger at that moment. This is an example of the second kind of dream as listed by Artemidorus. Peter objected to eating unclean food, and the voice countered, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. It happened three times. In Peter's subsequent encounter with Cornelius, the God-fearing centurion, whose dream vision instructed Cornelius to summon Peter to his home, Peter grasps the significance of his dream. Experiencing the descent of the Spirit upon Cornelius and his entourage, Peter realized that his dream was indeed predictive of this encounter. This resulted in a change in attitude of certain Judean believers in Jesus toward totally enculturated secular Israelites, civilized Hellene, Greek-speaking, Greek-living, Greek-eating Israelites, secular Israelites who wanted to believe in and accept Jesus as Messiah. The third kind of dream is an oracle in which the dreamer's parent or a priest, or a god, or some other respected person, reveals clearly a course of action for the dreamer. What the dreamer should do, or should not do. This word, krematismos, is the Greek word Paul uses in Romans chapter 11, verse 4, to describe Elijah's encounter with God on the mountain, back in 1 Kings chapter 19. God instructed Elijah there to anoint two kings, and to anoint his successor as prophet, Elisha. Clearly, in the Israelite tradition, God does communicate in dreams. 